Excellencies and Ambassador, distinguished guests and delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We are very excited to welcome you all in today's roundtable as this is our first event after the monsoon revolution with the title Bangladesh 2.0, a new security agenda for the interim government. The moderator for today is Major General A.N.M. Muniruzzaman, NDC PSC retired president BIPS, and the expert panelists who will be in conversation today are Major General Mohammad Shahidul Haq, PSC retired former defense attache to Myanmar and former ambassador to Libya, Brigadier General Shahidul Anam Khan, NDC PSC retired former associate editor and editor defense and strategic affairs, <coughs> The Daily Star, and Mr. Shafkat Munir, head of Bangladesh Center for Terrorism Research, BCTR, and senior research fellow, BIPS. Now I'd like to request the moderator to continue with the rest of the session. Thank you so much. Thank you. And a very warm welcome to you all, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> to our round table this afternoon, talking about a new security agenda for the interim government of Bangladesh. We are meeting here today under very different circumstances, what people in Bangladesh call the second independence. It's a post-revolution period, so therefore, I would like to start the order of the day by paying my deep respect to everybody who fought for the revolution and my condolences and respect for the students and citizens of Bangladesh who bravely fought and lost their lives. I would also like to pay my tribute to the armed forces of Bangladesh who stood by the constitution of the country and saved a very catastrophic day that could have been a bloodbath. They stood with the people of Bangladesh, with the citizens of Bangladesh. They stood with the constitution of Bangladesh. The armed forces belong to the people and the country, not to a party. And that's what they proved on that day. So my deep respect to all members of the armed forces. We are here to talk about an issue and an agenda which is critically important for Bangladesh and the interim government of Bangladesh. We stand at crossroads in Bangladesh today as we transition from 15 years of fascism to the aspirations of democratic Bangladesh. The interim government therefore has a tall order. It will have to address many, many reforms and structures of the state, a critical component of that will be the armed forces, the security sector, and the reforms in that sector. For going into detailed discussion today, we will not be touching on the police reform. For that day, we will take another day to discuss that. We are essentially discussing today on the armed forces and the intelligence services. A reform agenda for the government will include reforming the armed forces of the state, which in the last 15 years of Sheikh Hasina's rule was deeply, deeply politicized. The intelligence services lost its character of operating as a national intelligence service and started operating as a party extension. Those are the places where the interim government will have to look in depth and reform them as we move towards an election and, and democratic order. We will need comprehensive security sector reform. In all aspects of security, I would uh, recognize here the advisor for defense, who just joined us. Welcome, General, to the round table. So we will be needing comprehensive security sector reform if we have to make these organizations function again in the manner they should function. So to discuss these issues and much more, and also get your feedback as we draft 
a recommendation after the roundtable. We have a very expert panel to deliberate on the key issues of the subject. And without further ado, I shall hand over the microphone to Brigadier General Shahidul Adam Khan to start the discussion. You want to come later? OK. We can start with Brigadier Shahid. And Shahid, you have the floor for the next 15 minutes. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I shall also start with my tribute to the uh, revolutionaries and those uh, who were killed brutally, and also to the armed forces of Bangladesh. Uh, I'll just specially about, cover about the security aspects which related to our two big uh, two neighbors. You know, all of you know that Bangladesh has got two neighbors or rather I'll reframe it, very difficult neighbors, both of them, uh, for different reasons at different times. So first, uh, first I'll start with Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar is that, um, I'll say, um, before I start actually, I'll give you just what is happening near our border, and it's a very dangerous uh, state at this moment as we are talking. You know, Myanmar, uh, before that I'll just to add, Myanmar is not going to disintegrate. Let it be clear about that, because a lot of uh, Western, especially analysts, they have been uh, saying since last year that Myanmar is going to disintegrate. I'm telling you that Myanmar is not going to disintegrate. This is for sure. Number one, uh, number two is that Myanmar military, which is uh, fighting battles all its peripheries, is also not going to fall. Yes, it has. There are certain uh, battles which have been fought especially on the eastern sector, that is um, border with uh, Thailand, China, Laos. Those are kind of controlled battles because the, most of the ethnic armies are supported or controlled by Chinese or Thais. And in, in, some of them are also, uh, um, what is that called, supported by um, uh, Western nations. Now I, I'll come to, uh, straight to the border, what is happening near us. Of, um, you know, um, at this moment, sir, yes, sir. Especially, uh, um, uh, just one sentence I'll say that uh, since yesterday, Arakan Army, a, a non state actor, is controlling 95% of the territory of northern and central Rakhine. The only city which is left to be occupied by this ethnic group is the Sitwe. Otherwise, border between Bangladesh and Myanmar is controlled by this ethnic group. All the trade routes are also at this moment, since yesterday, is also controlled by uh, this uh, ethnic armies, which is called Arakan uh, Army. Now, I'll go straight away to the, what we can do. Before that, I'll just say, I, I, I had been asking this question to, for the last 10 years plus. What is actually our policy on this, uh, the things which is happening in, in Myanmar in our neighborhood? To my uh, surprise, rather, I, I was really embarrassed to find out there is no policy because nobody could tell me. And the policy which I could uh, identify is that maintaining status quo is the policy which we followed for so long. So uh, now I'll straight go to the, what we can do. What is the policy we should be maintaining? Uh, first of all, that, that Bangladesh should see the relationship with Myanmar not through Rohingyas. It should be seen through a geostrategic, uh, what is it called, shifts which has occurred because of the rise of China and containment of China by other nations. And this is a very dangerous situation for us. We should see in that perspective, not through Rohingya crisis, which we had been seeing for the last 20 around 20 years. So this is a very important, I, I'll suggest uh, that we should see through geopolitical lens, not through Rohingya lens. Next one is that uh, I'll require, um, I'll again uh, come, since which I, one point which I've been hammering since last January, that we must engage with Arakan army. It's, it's a fact whether uh, Myanmar army wins the battle or not, Arakanis are going to control this piece of land. 
At this moment, this piece of land is controlled by non-state uh, actors. And they are going to be there. We must engage with them and also put our uh, policies across that no matter in what form they are uh, there in, in Rakhine, they need Bangladesh for their own survival. This is a, uh, be it political, geo, uh, I mean economic, I mean you name it, anything. They need Bangladesh for survival because they have, don't have any other access towards uh, Bamar proper, that is Myanmar proper. <clears throat> Next is that I'll request, rather this is the time, I think it's already we've been waiting for last seven years. Nothing happened because of the policy or lack of policy which is happening. That this is the time we should at least mobilize our forces with Myanmar border. We have got a formation, we should mobilize that formation because this was what which was supposed to be done in 2017. That's what we did in 1978, and that's what we did in 1993. This is what, this is a normal routine for any military, but unfortunately we didn't do it. We should mobilize at least a brigade there to give uh, the message across that enough is enough. No more, uh, I mean, uh, no battle, rather no uh, uh, breaking of the sanctity of our border, and no pushing in of Rohingyas anymore towards us. This is a, my third proposal, uh, recommendation. And another one is that this is also high time because it's been seven years that you must remember only Bangladesh has provided Myanmar with a very, very peaceful border for the last 50 years. I repeat, 50 years. But what we have got, we always got rowing as, uh, towards us. That must be changed. Now, how? But you remember the, the how peaceful we have provided. They have got a big formation in, uh, in, in, in near our border. What they have done since this is a peaceful border, so they have shifted all their forces towards uh, uh, eastern border, border with uh, China, Laos, and Thailand, and also India. But there is hardly any troops um, beside us. This is very, very visible, especially when they are fighting with Arakan army. They don't have any troops, rather they don't have any strategy assets to fight Arakan army and insurgent group uh, fighting them. So this is the one fault line, fault line we, should, we should be exploring uh, to exploit. And another, there are a number of fault lines here. There is a very serious ethnic divide, which you haven't looked into. Because as I was saying, that we had been looking through Rohingya's lenses, all our policy towards Myanmar. So this is the high time we should look into the fault lines like ethnic divide, economic vulnerabilities, supply chain and trade routes. I can assure you these all things are, even if it is an independent country, Arakan, they have to, uh, what is it called, go through or they need assistance of Bangladesh. So this is the one we can use this uh, uh, fault line for both of them, either Myanmar military or Arakanis that this is the time, if you don't do this one, we are going to do this one. So these are the things we, I will request to um, play with. Uh, rather, this is a policy we should be shifting. Next one is Burma Act. This is an act enacted by US um, to help the Myanmar Democratic uh, Forces, especially NUGs, to uh, recover the democracy through non-lethal act. But what is surprising is there, None of Myanmar's neighbors have so far, so far supported or given consent to this Myanmar, oh sorry, the Burma Act. In fact, not only that, some of the, um, I mean, um, uh, what is it called, neighbors, they see this one as a uh, containment policy of, extension of containment policy of US against China. So this is one I'll request, I'll recommend that we should not join this Burma Act because it is not going to benefit us, rather we'll be entangling with the interest of other countries. And lastly, in, um, in, in Myanmar one, is that organizing Rohingyas. These are also high time that we should organize Rohingyas politically first, politically first. Then we should go for the plan B. That is, uh, I mean, the way others, others did, 
the way our neighbors did with us. So plan B is also there, but before that, we should organize them politically. Having finished with, uh, having finished with uh, Myanmar, now I'll go over to the, our largest neighbor, big brother who is surrounded us by three sides, and it has got a very important role in our history, both good and bad, unfortunately. But what is, uh, you'll be surprised to hear, I mean, I'm going to inform you that since 1968, in, if you see, read the books uh, of the um, strategy analyst, in, especially if you read the K. Subramaniam, most of you know possibly, K. Subramaniam is the father of present uh, foreign minister of India, Mr. Jay Shankar's father. So he has a very interesting um, books written in 70s, including one of them is before 25, 25 March 1971. So what is what was there? They need a compromised landscape to further their interest in the Northeast and to deal with uh, China. This is what they wanted for the last 50 years. I mean, they didn't bother about uh, our concern of security, economy, and other things. To do this one, the, all the projects what we had been seeing, including last 15 years, what we had we exper experienced is extension of what Mr. K. Subramaniam said in 1970, uh, in March 1971. So in, to do, achieve that one, what they have done, the number one thing they did that they planned number of uh, transit, connectivity, corridors and trap ship and routes all over Bangladesh, through all over Bangladesh, I repeat, through all over the Bangladesh. And they have planned five types of co corridors. One of them is transport. Tra in the transport, it has got rail, it has got uh, roads, and it has got riverine. Next one is maritime, also through us. Another one is energy, also through us. Finance, this is also, th they wanted to reach China through Bangladesh. This is also in their strategic, uh, what they call, uh, which uh, strategy which they had been following since uh, 2008. And lastly, the trade. These are the five corridors they have used. And most of these corridors are at different stages of completion. Some have completed, some have not completed. And unfortunately, we Bangladeshis don't know anything about it. What are, where are the, these contributions? We came to know when it, has, was, it was inaugurated. I'm sure most of us, we don't know. Where is that? But we came to know when Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister has inaugurated that one, that we found out, oh, there is a railway station there. So these are the things which is happening here. And this is the way it is done that, I mean, at this moment, I've counted seven major railway link with India and uh, uh, through Bangladesh. And this is not that uh, okay, I can go to Nepal with that rail line. It's not. Neither I can go to Bhutan. Neither I can go to Thailand. Neither I can go to Pakistan. So this is only a particular uh, portion it is going, and a particular distance it is going, and it is only used by uh, India. What is tragic in this one, just a couple of years, uh, two years back, one of our former foreign sec uh, uh, former cabinet secretary, he for, in front of a television, national television, he accepted the route which is passing through us. India can import and export through this one. But we Bangladeshi, our exporter, cannot use the same route. And he told that this is a thing they have overlooked and they are going to correct it. So this is the tragedy of this whole amuse and all those things. And lastly, I'll say that cancellation of 500, rather half a billion dollar loan to Bangladesh. This is a, a loan thrusted upon Bangladesh Armed Forces. And the equipment list, we don't know what are the equipment, but I found out, I, I got this equipment list from the Indian newspapers, Indian uh, sources. And I can tell you one thing, the items Indians are trying to sell us, it is not going to improve our combat efficiency or overall forces capabilities. So we should cancel this uh, 500 million, uh, half a billion dollar uh, loan protocol, which is, which is not going to um, uh, have any beneficial, rather it will be a burden. Another one is the 
coastal radar. You must have heard that uh, India is trying to install 20 uh, coastal radars. And I can assure you, uh, the way I saw in Indian newspaper, not in our one, that they are going to monitor the ship movements. But you see, it's a, it's a, we are a sovereign country. And how come they are going to monitor uh, uh, maritime uh, what is it called, traffic of uh, uh, traffic um, of others from our coastline. So, but what I'm trying to say is that that this is going to be a big problem because from our coastline, uh, you will find that if you uh, uh, tra try to track um, uh, the traffic of other third country, this is going to be a big problem for us. And finally, I'll request that there are a number of many, many uh, MUs were signed between uh, uh, last government and uh, India. And around, among them is five is major. And this, f all MUs should be reviewed because all those MUs have got confidentiality clause, which we don't know. What is that in that clause? So this is, has to be uh, made public and reviewed and finally discussed and uh, see what is inside in this uh, MUs. And in the end, I'll say that CHT, Chittagong Hill Tracks, I'm afraid because of this uh, renewal uh, attention to uh, this Bay of Bengal, our CHT is in a vulnerable position. It's not because, because there are a number of uh, ethnic groups or I think armies have been sponsored by different uh, parties, including our two neighbors. Also, there are a number of suicidal infrastructure which has come around this, this CHT which is really very dangerous for our security. With that, I end. Thank you very much. Shail, thank you very much for bringing up very, very relevant points, but some of the key takeaways from his presentation, there is an altered security environment in our border in Myanmar, particularly in Rakhine. The Bangladesh Armed Forces need to look at that re-strategize as to how we shall meet the challenge of new entities who are taking control of the bordering state of Rakhine, which borders Bangladesh. That's a reality we have to recognize very fast and act to engage those entities in Rakhine. Second point is, it is also a changed reality in our borders with India. We have to be more dynamic in us understanding the changes that are taking place in our in the Bangladesh border. And the other point that he mentioned, there have been several treaties and agreements and MOUs that were signed by the government of Bangladesh and the government of India over the last 15 years. All of them were non-transparent and opaque. Even treaties that were signed with India, as per the Constitution, had to be placed before the Parliament within 30 days. They were never done. So we as citizens don't know what is there. I as a Bangladeshi don't know the overflight agreement that was signed between the governments of Bangladesh and India by which Indian military aircrafts can overfly Bangladesh at will. Those are the places we need to revisit and find out whether they were done keeping the interest of the country at the topmost, or we should review them now. With that, I shall now hand over the microphone to Shavkat, and Shavkat, you have the floor for the next 15 minutes. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Advisor for Defense and National Solidarity, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. I would like to begin uh, my remarks by paying my own humble tribute to all those who uh, paid with their lives and the sacrifices that were made in this revolution of students and citizens, which I call the monsoon revolution. As we sit here to talk about a security agenda for Bangladesh 2.0, the first thing that comes to mind is, what are we trying to secure? We have never had a definitional clarity in Bangladesh about what our security needs and threats are. So the first order of business would be to map out 
or do a comprehensive assessment of understanding Bangladesh's security challenges. We can stay here until midnight if we talk about what happened over the last 16 years. But uh, I would like to focus more on the future, but we will have to revisit the past every now and then. Over the last 16 years, it had become fashionable in Bangladesh to decry that Bangladesh has any traditional security challenges. And many people went around town saying that Bangladesh's only challenges are non -secu traditional security challenges. We need to come out of those hidebound ideas and face the grim reality that confronts us. As any country, Bangladesh also faces its own plethora of traditional and non-traditional security challenges. And our security apparatus, particularly the Bangladesh Armed Forces, have to be prepared to meet those challenges. The chair has already alluded to this, but I think one of the first things we must remember, and I would like to quote former US Chairman, Joint Chief of Staff, General Mark Mealy, who said in his farewell uh, or change of command parade, that the, and I'm paraphrasing here, that the military does not belong to any wannabe dictator, the military, military does not belong to a party, but the military belongs to the republic. And that is a message not just true for the United States military, but it is a message which is true for the Bangladesh Armed Forces and all militaries in a democratic society around the world. That is something we have to reestablish, that the security sector is here to serve the republic and not the whims and fancies of any government or any autocrat. Bangladesh must urgently shift its focus towards a broad spectrum of security challenges, encompassing cybersecurity, climate security, counterterrorism, and information warfare. While we look at the many traditional facets of security, we must also look at these areas. And then we must chart a comprehensive national security strategy. We have defense policy, we have forces goal, but we do not have a national security strategy. All countries these days have a national security strategy where all the security challenges are identified and strategies formulated. We need, in this Bangladesh 2.0, our second republic, we need clarity of thinking, we need focused thinking, and we need thinking beyond slogan making. Gone are the days of friendship with all and malice to none. We do not want Bangladesh to be hidebound in slogans or paying obeisance to individuals and their ideas. This Bangladesh must have a very clearly charted agenda, and that agenda also needs to be in the security sector. We have had uh, national security councils in various forms over the years, but we have never had a proper national security council secretariat. And we can look at multiple models, like the Republic of Korea, Singapore, Australia. I actually wrote my master's thesis looking at the national security architecture of Singapore and Australia and how it can be adopted for Bangladesh. So we need to look at those structures because a defense advisor or national security advisor needs to be supported by domain matter experts and subject matter experts. And those domain and subject matter experts will sit, sit within the National Security Council Secretariat who will provide the advisor and the chief advisor or prime minister with domain and subject matter expertise. I think that is something we urgently need to address. And I'm really heartened that our honorable advisor is here. So I hope we will be able to share some of these inputs with him and his team in due course. Bangladesh's challenges are evolving. No country ever faces security challenges which are static. Security challenges are dynamic. And therefore, the posture of the armed forces, posture of the security forces has to evolve with those challenges. Many countries like Australia also prepare a document called a posture statement. So I think we could learn from those ideas. We also need a complete revitalization and rejuvenation of how we do military education and training. We need to look at how our training is structured, how our military education is structured, and reevaluate whether those training and education curriculum or modules are in keeping with the challenges that Bangladesh are facing. One of the beauties of uh, Bangladesh 2.0 is the whole world is now here to assist us. I have been reading in the newspaper every day how our friends, our allies, those of us who stood in this fight for freedom, they're going to the chief advisor and respect, uh, honorable advisors and offering their help. So we should seek that help from countries like United States, UK, Australia, and so on. 
and try to uh, learn from them, try to adopt some of their models, and customize it for uh, Bangladesh's needs. Because I think there are many good models around the world which we could look at. Cybersecurity will emerge as a very serious challenge for Bangladesh in the coming days. We, have already, we are already aware about a very debilitating cyber heist which took place in the Bangladesh Bank under the previous government. I don't want to go too much into what caused it and what was done about it, but that is one type of cyber threat. But multiple other cyber threats are emerging, and for a country like Bangladesh, cyber vulnerability will always be very significant. We have already faced significant amount of cyber threats from Myanmar. We will also face cyber threats from other countries. So I would uh, humbly request the interim government to kindly look into this area of how we can develop uh, greater resilience and greater defense against cybersecurity. But cyber can also be a domain where we could also develop offensive capabilities, and we should uh, look at that as well. For too long, under the, uh, before the monsoon revolution, we were very squeamish about our security and defense threats and challenges. We were almost embarrassed to talk about anything lest it should upset a particular country or a group of people. We, should, we need to come out of that squeamishness, we need to be aggressive, we need to be bold, and we must stand for our national interest. In addition to cybersecurity, we also need to look at the security implications of climate change. And a potential national security strategy that will be developed in the coming days must look at the security threats emanating from climate change. We all know about the huge effect climate change has on our ecology, our economy, and our country as a whole. But there are multiple security implications of climate change, many of the non-traditional security threats we talk about, such as health, food, disease, et cetera, which also fall within the domain of uh, climate security. And I'm very proud to say that BIPS has been one of the pioneering institutions in this country and in the region uh, talking about climate security. And so therefore, we are very keen that climate security should also be part of our security agenda. <coughs> Sorry. We must also look at structures, ladies and gentlemen. Where is the politico-military coordination in the current structure of government of Bangladesh? I have been suggesting for many years now, but it mostly fell on deaf ears in the past, that there needs to be a person within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to undertake political military coordination, especially as Bangladesh has such huge international peacekeeping obligations. Where is the political military input going to the MOFA? I know uh, the Armed Forces Division interfaces with them regularly, but we probably need somebody within the MOFA at the level of Director General, perhaps a Brigadier General or equivalent from the armed forces, who will be doing the political military coordination. If you look at the State Department, and again, one might say State Department is a whole other ball game altogether, but we have to study structures. If you look at the State Department, there is an entire Bureau for Political Military Affairs, assisted, uh, headed by an Assistant Secretary. There are similar examples in other countries. Even in our neighboring country, India, similar structures have been created. There is even a military advisor to the Cabinet Secretariat. The military must have its input within the policy-making process, particularly in terms of formulation of foreign and security policy. Similarly, it's very encouraging that the chief advisor has very urgently appointed an advisor for defense. We could potentially look at having a military advisor in the chief advisor or prime minister's office to act as a coordination between the military and the chief advisor's office, in addition to the AFD. So if this is a revolution, which it is, then we must think outside the box and look at those structures. We need more investment in academic programs on strategic studies. Our international relations departments under the previous government have turned into departments for gender studies. Our places which have basically become uh, an area where academics can uh, transition to become consultants. We need departments, uh, we need these departments to have a renewed focus on strategic studies. We need these departments to have a renewed focus on defense studies. And uh, that is an urgent need of the hour. We need to have a greater development of expertise on all levels of security across Bangladesh. We had very little knowledge, we had very little academic understanding or very little academic discourse 
on subjects of traditional security in our universities. That needs to change right now. We need to reevaluate and update our security cooperation mechanisms. Our security cooperation must be aligned with our commitment to the rules-based international system. One of the urgent priorities of the monsoon revolution is to realign Bangladesh to the rules-based international order. The days of friendship with all and malice to none are firmly behind us. We need to forge stronger alliance with like-minded countries, and those alliances, those cooperation mechanisms, need to be keeping in mind our national interest. We need to clearly uphold and identify what our core values are. No defense policy, no national security strategy, no military can perform its role unless they know what are our core values. What are we defending? Are we just defending the territory of the People's Republic of Bangladesh? Or are we also defending the core values that make us Bangladeshi? I would like to, and you will probably hear this from all speakers, but I will be remiss if I don't mention it myself. We need a complete and urgent depoliticization of our entire security apparatus. Not just the uh, armed forces, not just the police. We need a reprofessionalization of our intelligence agencies. I know some people are making some very ludicrous comments that certain agencies should be abolished. It's not a problem with the agencies. It's a problem with individuals. It's a problem with the political masters who exploited, used, and abused those agencies. These agencies are here to perform a very important task. They are absolutely pivotal to the security of Bangladesh. So we need to find a way, and the interim government, I'm sure, is already doing that, of how those agencies can be reprofessionalized revitalized and depoliticized. I would also say that uh, we have to take a fresh look at counterterrorism and countering violent extremism. It is absolutely true that under the Sheikh Hasina regime, counterterrorism and countering violent extremism had been uh, largely used in many cases for political gain. Some very gory details of, are emerging, and there are people in this room who have done academic studies on how CT was used as a political tool. But as a, somebody who has worked on counterterrorism for most of his professional life, I believe that we, it is also important for us to acknowledge that there is a threat, not just for Bangladesh, but also across the region. And we need to take a fresh look at our threat from terrorist and extremist organizations and how we can deal with those. And never again, should counter-terrorism, counter-radicalization, counter-extremism be used for political gain. Unless we are able to do these things, the security agenda for Bangladesh's Second Republic will remain incomplete. And the work needs to start urgently. And I will be absolutely remiss if I don't talk about my own tribe, and that is the think tanks. The think tanks have a vital role to play. Uh, in the past 16 years, we were divided between those who were in favor of the regime and those who were not in favor of the regime. But the time has come for all of us to unite together as Bangladeshis and work together to build the Second Republic. And here, I think the think tanks and civil society can play a very important role. But I would again say that there needs to be very clear, out-of-the-box thinking. There are no holy cows in this anymore. We have to look at every single aspect. If needed, changes need to be brought. And if needed, revolutionary changes need to be brought. We owe this to the Saeeds, the Mughdhos, and all the martyrs of this revolution, for whom today I sit here in presence of intelligence agencies and others, and in presence of an honorable advisor, and can, can speak with this degree of confidence and without an atom of fear in my mind. No longer my mind trembles in Orwellian fear or no longer my eyes scan towards the door to see if somebody is listening to it. No longer shall I go back and wonder or stay up at night thinking which agency will call me the next morning asking for an explanation. That is the beauty, ladies and gentlemen, of this monsoon revolution. That is the beauty that students like them have brought to us. So I once again pay a tribute to our students, our citizens. Let us all work together to build this new Bangladesh, to paraphrase Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, long years ago, we had made a pact with history. The time has come for Bangladesh to redeem that pledge, not fully, but wholly and very substantially. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Shafkat, because you have brought out very relevant points that need to be taken note of. I shall, for the interest of time, just mention a few. What we need to do is identify national core values. And identification of core values can only be done when people are factored in. It cannot be done in some headquarter. It's to be discussed, debated with the people so that we can identify the national core values that the armed forces should de defend. We need to look at a fresh assessment of our threat environment, the threat environment around us and beyond us, because the threat environment has changed and is constantly evolving. I also need to mention here that the defense policy that was enacted or written for Bangladesh is obsolete. We need to have a fresh look at that defense policy, and these are live documents. These are not static documents. And defense policy is not a secret document. Everybody has got the right to know the basics of the defense policy. So the defense policy need to be re-evaluated. And as Shavkat has very rightly suggested, we need a comprehensive national security strategy that encompasses everything. We need to have capacity in our armed forces to fight hybrid warfare. And that will be the kind of warfare that perhaps many nations will have to fight in the future. We are also urging that we have the capacity and the knowledge to have the tools ready to fight in the gray zone. And the gray zone warfare is the capacity that Bangladesh needs now. Climate security is fundamental to Bangladesh's security because we are a climate vulnerable nation. So the armed forces must have comprehensive understanding and capacity to have the tools to fight a climate war. I'm happy to say that BIPS is conducting a three-year study on this very aspect together with our friends in the European Union and we shall come up every year with a comprehensive paper on our climate security threat. Lastly, I would like to say that we have to have all the democratic orders and the papers that are needed for armed forces. For example, the armed forces should have a white paper every year. The people must know what is going on. The people have the right to know how their taxpayers' money is being spent. These are not issues that are opaque. These are issues that should be transparent. We need to have a look at all our security cooperation and strategies. We need greater commitment and clarity on Indo-Pacific strategy and our rule-based international order. So we have a lot of work to do, and we are just mentioning only a few. With that, I shall now turn to Brigadier Shadul Aram Khan, Sir, you have the floor for the next 15 minutes. I shall stand at the summit. Please, up to you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, the respected guests. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> I <clears throat> stand up with a degree of trepidation. Being an infantryman, we normally switch off at 2 o'clock. It's past, it's almost past 4 o'clock. So being in a torpid state, I have stood up so that I can do my best to <clears throat> keep all the others awake along with myself. As the chairman said, we have a lot of work to do. But being the third speaker, my work has been reduced. Most of the points that I had have already been spelled out. All that remains for me is to ditto uh, all that has been said. But I'll do a bit more, more than that and add a bit from my own thoughts uh, to, the, to, to this topic. My remit was policy options 
uh, for the new security agenda, given the, 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 the changes that have occurred in the last one month, and given the monsoon revolution, and ask ourselves, why the revolution at all? Why did it have to come about at all in the first place, the monsoon revolution? But before that, I think we need to be on the same grid as to, as to, as to uh, the, the definition of threat and security. I think these two are cognate words, and they, and they mean one the same thing. We use it fungibly. So if you, look at, if you want to address security, you have to look at the threat. And what are the threats that we are facing? The two speakers before me, they touched upon the, 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 the realist approach, to the realist approach of the, of the threat to the state, the well-being of the state. I would rather uh, address the threat as being people-oriented or people-centric, because unless the people are secure, the nation, the country cannot be secure. <clears throat> so let us ask ourselves, what is threat or what is security that we are talking about? I think uh, uh, security is a, a, a state where there is an absence of coercive uh, influence on a nation, on a people, to exercise its options uh, and its policies uh, internally and externally. Therefore, I'm suggesting that you are secure to the extent and you have, uh, you have reduced threat to the extent that you can or you have the elbow space to make your own plans without being dictated, to make your own policies without being, uh, uh, without, without being subject, subject to the influence of other forces external and internal. So from that point, let us proceed and ask ourselves, in the last 53 years of our existence, what are the inflection points in the last 53 years that engendered the security of the state, of the country? 71 was one, 75 was one, uh, 81 was one, the anti shad movement was one, and now a wonderful uh, phrase, the, October, the monsoon revolution was one. Which of these points we as Bangladeshis feel have we had to face the greatest, the gravest threat to our existence as individuals, as a nation, as a country, and I'm talking about the entire uh, range of the last 15 or 16 years of, of, the, of the last regime uh, that I suggest has been perhaps one that has engendered or endangered uh, the, 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 the gravest, uh, in, uh, the, the country, uh, the maximum. Why? Simply because the lack of good governance if one were to uh, cite an example of bad governance, one would have, would have to perhaps include the, 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 the events of the last 16, 17 years and assess the characteristics of good governance, which is the rule of law, democratic practice, weak state institutions, effective parliament, corruption, accountability, transparency, devolution of power, and separation of power. May I ask, which of these you think were fulfilled, or which of these were met? The rule of law, uh, accountability, democratic practice, did we have personal liberty as individuals, as, 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 as corporate bodies, as, <clears throat> as a member of a political party? Freedom of speech, as, as Shafkat just mentioned. Could he speak 
openly and frankly, without fearing that the big brother is looking behind us, that somebody is snooping. What I'm suggesting is that the rule, the, the good governance or, or non-governance predominate the entire 15 or 16 years of the last regime. And therefore, when I suggest some panacea, it, 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 is, it may be easy to suggest, but it may not be so easy to, to, to implement those, 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 those quickly because those cannot be uh, 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 implemented overnight. For example, uh, how do you ensure the rule of law overnight? When the culture has been to violate law, when the law was expected by its violation and not by its implementation. <clears throat> Can we democratize a society where the basic concept of democracy was trampled? Can we talk about democracy or, or, or develop a democratic culture overnight? Can we, can, we have a, can we have a proper democratic culture with the elements that have been used or that have hogged the political life of this country for the last 52 to 53 years? I, I, I put it to you uh, in, in, in simple terms. What about transparency and, and, and accountability? What about, what, about, what about corruption? Imagine the, imagine the, 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 the profligacy in the, in the economic and fiscal field sector. How the banks have been robbed. How banks were set up to support chronic capitalism. So when you're talking about uh, policy options, I suggest we have good governance before anything else. If you have good governance, if you have the rule of law, if everybody follows the law, if everybody is accountable, because an unelected, unelected body will never be accountable to the people, because they care to hoots for the, for the people, because they don't have to. We had, a, we had a very warped parliament. So, so the, 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 the literature, political science literature, has a new chapter on Bangladesh democracy, I suggest, to see how democracy was, 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 was distorted. But let me nevertheless suggest a few, uh, a, a few, a few uh, points as to, uh, as, as to how we could um, to start with, because if you want to cover a thousand miles, you have to start with the first step. So let us see. I suggest we, 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 we do something about political reforms. Muscle and money plays the big part. It cannot but do though, because if you seek, uh, to seek <coughs> a nomination, you have to put a close of Taka. So where does a man get close of Taka, close of Taka to seek nomination? Okay, he gets gross record sick to, to get nomination, so he has to make up that money that he, he, has, he, has, he has paid to get his nomination. So therefore, money and muscle power plays a big part. Let us not make politics a family affair. It has become sort of the, you know, the law of primogeniture. The son takes off from the father, or the daughter takes off from the mother, and so it becomes Gaddinashin period, you know? So if MP dies, his wife or her husband takes over, becomes an MP. This is rubbish. I think this sort of, uh, something has been done to prevent this, this, this sort of practices. We must understand that elected parents are not, are not masters, they are servants. Because we think as uh, the, 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 they think the, the, the political the, the, the reps are they are not reps in the first place because they are not elected. But they claim to be masters. We want to be we want to be governed but not ruled. What we are, what we faced was as a rule, not a, a, a governance. <coughs> we want a political culture 
where there will be peaceful handover of power and not where you know the head of the government has to not only leave his chair but just leave, leave our country a helicopter. helicopter and whatever so what is the what is the, what is the, what is the justification of 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 seeking power when at the end of the day you have to you have to you have to sort of run away from the country as 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 a fugitive what is what you know there are 17 crore people in this country only 650 sought refuge in the cantonments cantonments can't become havens of political ruffians what were they afraid of unless there's something wrong so we can't afford cantonments to become safe havens of of such sub rogues and ruffians <clears throat> the rule of law again a big thing systemic overall the legal system and the judiciary i suggest we have separated the judiciary i am not calling for independent judiciary because nobody is independent in this country except the people when people are sovereign people are not answerable to anybody but from the president down to the peon is answerable to the people so we don't want uh, uh, independence but we want separation of the judiciary but at the end of the day if we are so politically beholden whatever system you evolve it will be wrecked because of the political nexus between the judiciary and the and the politics some of the points have already been said but i will nonetheless uh, mention the need to reform the security sector it involves the police the military the paramilitary and the military they have to be reformed <coughs> dgfi in fact i wrote i wrote i wrote an article 10 years ago about the dgfi lakshman rekha and what we should about dgfi but the use of dgfi for a, as a political tool is not a recent a recent recent phenomenon it has been used since the inception of this country it has been used since the since 1972 and it has it it it, it has come down through time only thing is it has been used in a more blatant offensive and obscene manner so when you talk about threat of security we often forget that the administration that the state can be a cause of its own insecurity because of actions and inactions so therefore reform of the security sector and reform of the intelligence agencies with defined tier the police implement the draft police reform which also among other things asked for a police commission yes i know one minute 70 seconds okay the police should stop mimicking the armed forces it is it is it is not a force it is an agency law enforcing agency but all the trappings have been appropriated by, from the military i suggest we 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 consider this and the and the and the advisor himself is here i hope it will be addressed we stop make me making the headband that we use has, has has a history the flag in the car that we use has a history why a brigade commander use the solid is is the duff tail and not tall it is it has a history therefore we should all have why should the police have high velocity weapons why sniper weapons what for it's not a right control uh, and the mindset you reform the police and you reform the policemen also therefore this all thing will have to be addressed immediately the armed forces in particular we swear by the constitution to uphold the constitution not the political party and i repeat on my full level that has been said and and the caveat is that it will not act as long as national your national uh, interest or national security not stake and i i, I commend the the army and the armed forces for having taken the stand that they did in refusing to refusing to 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 to, to fire, fire on the people i hope they are at sooner
And there is our ex-chief, General Nuruddin, who told General Ashad bl bl blandly, sorry, we'll not go out and fire on the And that was that. I wish it had, done, it had been done sooner. It would save 650 or 700 lives. Yes, we have a defense policy, but as it revised, it should be revised every, 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 every regularly. We need a defense strategy too, not only a defense policy, but a defense strategy too. What is the defense strategy? Is it, it is it, it defensive, it is offensive, it is limited offensive. We, we must know that. The, there should be a parliamentary committee on defense who should be headed by a person who knows about defense, who knows the defense between a flute and a rocket launcher. Not somebody who has been selling fish in the market in his off time. Meter or meter readers. Uh, review the defense agreements done with our, our, with, with our, with our, with our friends and others. Reassess the policy of open procurement from neighbors. Strategy of open procurement. It is very important. When, when, <laughs> when onion export can be, can be stopped, at short notice, what prevents them from uh, stopping spares of mix or MI-17? I think this is very <coughs> imprudent to go whole hog and, and, and one country focus defense uh, 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 association. And preparing for tomorrow's, not yesterday's war. I think we need, we need to have a, a certain development, not only for the armed forces, but also in the foreign policy, in the foreign ministry, and everywhere else, where we have to look, we, have, we, look, <clears throat> we think dynamic, dynamically, and we we, have, we, look, we look forward. We have to review all the trade and transit policies, and place them before the parliament. We also have to reassess our strategic assets, and how they have been used so far. And I have. Thank you. As I was saying, reassess our strategic assets and how they have been used so far. And, 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 and perhaps uh, 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 determine how they can be better utilized. That will accrue where advantage accrue to us. As far as transit is concerned, we are not against transit. But we must also equally gain from giving transit to our neighbor. <coughs> if transit reduces the cost of uh, commodities, because India can then uh, sell their Indian commodity in, 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 the, in, the, in the seven sisters, replacing Bangladeshi, Bangladeshi uh, commodity, then Bangladesh must be adequately uh, compensated for the loss of the market. Have we done that? <coughs> so therefore, we have to also assist. But immediately we must launch a counter media campaign to deal with the offensive and obscene media campaign that is being conducted by our neighbor. False suits are being passed to our suits. And there has been no attempt so far, or very little, to counter these media offensives. Unless we uh, organize this uh, separate uh, establishment body ourselves, uh, we'll not be able to sort of obviate the problem of this media offensive. I think I've, I have uh, used up all the, all the time at the disposal and perhaps been able to give some of the points that I thought would be relevant to this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brigadier Khan. I shall now turn to the advisor, but before I do that, just a few points for your deliberations and more. First of all, we need to reactivate effective defense committees. Our defense committees are not functioning at all. They have to be effective to work as democratic oversight over the services. We need far more oversight of defense budget, which is taxpayers' money. 
We need far more clarity in the expenditure that goes on in the Director General of Defense Purchase, or DGDP, because those are taxpayers' money. We certainly need better control, democratic control, over the intelligence services. We don't want an intelligence service anymore that will create Ainaghors. We can no longer have them with the name of a defense intelligence service. That is a shame to the armed forces. So therefore, there has to be parliamentary oversight committees of all intelligence work and agencies. I would suggest, as per the Constitution, there should also be the Office of Ombudsman to look at disputes and other issues. We need better coordination mechanism for the intelligence assets that the state has. We should have a well laid out merit-based promotion system for officers in the armed forces so that they don't run after political patronage in securing higher ranks and promotions anymore. We want that a modernization process should start with armed forces. We would want that the armed forces must be better taught and have better protection on human rights issues, both at home and internationally. So there are much more to discuss, but I shall now turn to the advisor if you would like to say anything. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, respected uh, chair of today's roundtable, General Munir, my respected uh, commander, Brigadier General Shahidul Anam Khan, ladies and uh, gentlemen present here, Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon. I would like to begin by paying my deepest homage and respect to the hundreds of martyrs who were killed brutally and mercilessly, the children, the boys, girls, students, and citizens. I'd like to also pay sympathy, deepest sympathy to the hundreds who are languishing, losing their eyesight, losing their limbs, and suffering in the hospitals due to injuries suffered during the, the last uh, movement or the revolution of the students and the people. And also, our earnest salute to the students and citizens who were on the streets days and nights and who were eventually successful in bringing about a change, a downfall of a regime and the change that was uh, with, with loss of lives that was unprecedented, a bloodbath that was unprecedented, unprecedented other than the War of Liberation of 1971. I would like to say that when I received the invitation from uh, Jal Munir, I got a text uh, in which he, he sent out the invitation and also he, he mentioned that, uh, would you like to make some remarks? We have a, there is a, there is a round table on a new security agenda for the interim government. So when I looked at, at this, uh, at this text of General Munir, the chair of today's roundtable, I instantly thought that it would be too premature for a person like me, who is only in his fourth day as uh, the special assistant to the chief advisor, a person who is yet to meet his interlocutors, who is yet to even know the, the other, uh, other advisors in the chief advisor's cabinet, and uh, who is, who is yet, yet to get in touch with the stakeholders, with the people with whom uh, he is supposed to interact. So, so I would like to reiterate that it's, it's, it's in fact premature for me uh, to make remarks. The reason I'm here today in this roundtable is that when I looked at the, uh, at the uh, subject, a security agenda for the interim government, since I, I belong to the interim government, and uh, security is, is one of the major focus of my area of responsibility, of my domain, 
I thought that I would be benefited tremendously if I can attend this seminar. My, my, my former brigade commander, Jal Munir, I would benefit tremendously by, by their uh, comments, remarks, and presentations. So that is the motivation why I'm here today, to benefit uh, from the discussions, the, the presentations that, that took place, and also the discussions that would ensue in a few minutes. But I would like to share with you the experience of the last four days. I think that, that would not be uh, that uninteresting. When I, was, when I was called by the chief advisor to meet him before I was appointed, I was not able to reach his office because there was a blockade right in front of the chief advisor's office in Jomuna, which is close to the Hotel Sheraton near Romna Park. Most of you have passed by that, uh, that building, Jomuna. So I was stopped by police before I could reach. So I was not allowed to go because they stopped the, stopped the road. The thoroughfare was not allowed because three to 400 people were blockading and they were protesting right in front of the house. So I had to, I had to stop there and then contact uh, people so that I could, I could come and go. So it was a, it was a, it was a difficult uh, exercise for me to be able to enter Jomuna because Jomuna was under, I would not say siege, but it was a blockade by people who were protesting for meeting certain demands. So that was a, that, that, that was a kind of experience we have never seen before. Uh, the, uh, in the last 15 years, the Prime Minister's uh, office was a no-go for any protester of any kind. One kilometer, even, even no one could reach even, even, uh, even one kilometer close to the, uh, to the former Prime Minister's office, which is now in Tejgao. But here I was seeing a few hundred protesters are, are blockading. Fortunately, the chief advisor lives upstairs, so he was not required to go outside after the office. So he was saved from this blockade because his office was upstairs, and his, his, his living residence was upstairs, and he had to only climb up and down. So the, the blockade did not affect him, but those who were entering, they were affected by the blockade. And then on 25th August, we found that seven advisors were blockaded inside the Secretariat, which is the hub of the government, yes. the vital organ of the government, the interim government that has to function. And one of the advisors, uh, the advisor for home, after one round of negotiation, when he was coming out of the gate, because he thought that the first round of negotiation was successful, uh, the uh, representatives of the answers, seven or ten representatives, they had a successful di dialogue. They, were, uh, they, they went back and he thought that now it is time for all the advisors to return home at, at 6 or 7 p.m. And then he, all, all he found was that his vehicle was forced back inside, pushed back inside the secretariat. And again, there was another series of negotiations for, I think, two, three hours with 19 representatives of the answers. I would say embodied answers. And then it, uh, the negotiation continued. Uh, eventually, it was found that it failed. Negotiation failed. failed. The 2,000 answers, they were blockading 500 each in each, approximately 500 in each gates. So these, these advisors, seven advisors, were not able to go out. There was a complete siege or blockade of the, of the government's hub, the nerve center. So that was on 25th August, I think, about four days. And you all, you all know from the, from the media that the law enforcement completely failed. Never before in the last 16 years uh, we could see that uh, the, uh, the police never allowed any protesters to go and, and uh, lay a siege on the secretariat. But it, this happened uh, only about four days back. And uh, who actually removed the siege, dislodged the protesters? Not the law enforcement agencies. They were watching and witnessing. So we found that the students had to come and dislodge the protesters. I think these are, these are some of the things that are not, not very conducive for the, not, not, not good experiences for the interim government. That, and uh, here I would like to refer to Shafkat Munir's uh, interview. Uh, I think the 
with the fall, with the downfall of the of the fascist regime on 5th, Shafkat Munir was very prompt to give interview to one of the uh, prominent Indian. Karan Thapar. Hmm? Karan Thapar. Yes, Karan Thapar. Mm -hmm. So I found that Karan Thapar put Shafkat Munir onto the defensive, asking questions about why the minority communities are being harassed, attacked, and they're being persecuted. And Shafkat Munir was trying to defend. But I, I wonder why Shafkat Munir did not ask why 600 people, according to UN, were killed by a government that you have been supporting for so long. Why Karan Thapar was not put onto, onto the defensive? And why Shafkat Muni did not ask Karan Thapar that there was no transition? General Shahid, Shahidul Anam, he mentioned that there has to be transition, means that change of, change of, change of power in a democratic way so that, so that there, is, there is no, no absence of, of any, any government. Now, from the fifth till the new interim government took office on the eighth, for three days, practically, there was no government. There was no rule of law, there was no judiciary, and the police was practically in complete disarray. Their morale, their backbone, demolished. 400, close to 400 police stations, outposts, uh, etc., etc., were looted, vandalized, weapons looted. When, uh, I found that 5,400 weapons of different calibers, uh, different uh, sizes, have been looted, and till 25th of August, only one third, that means something like 800 have been recovered. So now imagine that two thirds of the weapons that were looted on the 5th or 6th or 7th have not been recovered. So these are some of the practical challenges, threats, and vulnerabilities that the present interim government has to deal with and has to undergo. This, these, these, are, these are vulnerabilities, and I think these are some of the security challenges that the present interim government is facing. Now, I would not like to lengthen or continue more. It's already too late. The, uh, the points that have been mentioned, or some of the points, I would just, let's just like, to, like to touch upon the, uh, the, um, the necessity or the need for revisiting our defense policy, the need for, for looking at or uh, evolving or preparing our national security strategy. I would only like to um, draw your attention, kind attention, to one point. That is, what is the agenda of this interim government? This government is not a political government. This government has been installed due to the revolution, the successful, unprecedented revolution of the students and citizens. And these students and citizens, they have dreamt of helping create conditions for a new Bangladesh. A new Bangladesh which they envisaged and they have dreamt and they they wanted to see they want to see a bangladesh which is which is free from discrimination where a bangladesh where the human rights the basic rights are upheld protected and maintained and also they want to see a bangladesh where there will not be a return of fascism when the elections are held, which means that essentially this government should carry out some fundamental reforms, some basic reforms, so that we do not return to a, an era where we do not see a future where the, there is a return to fascism. So I believe that is the agenda of, that should be the agenda of this of this interim government, and if that is the agenda of this new, work, new uh, the interim government, then how far it would be pragmatic or practical for this government to revisit the security strategy, to revisit uh, the defense policy, that is a big question. 
there are certain things which we may have to leave to a political government. But we can do certain things, we can do certain basic reforms, including reforms in the security sector, that would ensure that there is, even if, uh, when, when we have, when we transition to the political government, when we transition to a democratic process, we don't see a return to fascism, we don't see a return to autocracy. So with that, I would like to thank uh, the chair of today's roundtable for kindly inviting me. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. General, thank you for your kind remarks. And we shall summarize the proceedings of the discussion here today and, of course, send it to you and the Chief Advisor's Office. BIPS will be very happy to work very closely with the interim government of Bangladesh on all issues related to security. I shall now open the floor. Please indicate to me if you want to ask a question. My only request, we are running rather late, so please be very brief. Introduce yourself and ask a question or make a comment, but please be extremely brief. Okay, the floor is open. Uh, in the spirit of the times, we shall first go to young people. Okay, I see a hand there. Okay, please, you have the floor. Please introduce yourself. Uh, hello, good uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am S.M. Minam Hassan Roja from Bangladesh University of Professionals. So actually, there are lots of questions, but the time is very short. So I can uh, talk about in Myanmar. Just one question, one okay, question. Sir. Okay, sir. Then in government policy level, the fa fascism or the main problem is there, where is the policy makers? They come very politely in the power, and then they become like butchers. We see in previous government how they were killed, the students and the civilians. So TIB yesterday suggested about two terms. There will be a politician as a prime minister. What's, what we can see in the presidential level of USA, then how it's efficient to uh, compete, uh, and it's compatible in Bangladesh scenario that it will not happen again, that after 15 or 20 years, we will be the, on the estate and it will be the same issues and we will talk about it Bangladesh 3.0. So we don't want that. So in that scenario, <laughs> if this kind of policy could be changed, then I think the whole problem, the constitutional issues, the policy level issues should be changed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next question. Yes, Mr. Kabir. Sir, please introduce yourself for the rest of the crowd. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, my name is Humayun Kobir Bhuya. I am a journalist. Uh, uh, I had actually a lot of uh, things to say, but as General said, the time is short. I'll just uh, try to say a few things. Uh, number one, uh, I mean, many people still uh, are not able to understand the gravity of what happened in last one month, actually. I will just, uh, I'll just try to shape it with my own experience. As I said, I'm a journalist for many years, 33 years now. So I am not new to this type of thing. I was uh, in the procession against Asia I, uh, when I was at Dhaka University. Now, I had a daughter. I lost my daughter four years back. So I have now only one son. He is now in the final year of university. And the job of me and my wife was to stop him from going to uh, these professions, uh, processions. But I could not stop him. He took part in a processions where 15 people were killed. And my son could have been one of them. And I lost uh, my friend, very close friend, lost his child. So I am just, I am just saying this, that this was not a, this was not a simple thing. It, 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 it's, it was a great thing that happened. And I think it is incumbent to all of us to 
uh, seize the oppor opportunity uh, to change things for better. And just a couple of things I would say, as a uh, former military attaché to uh, Myanmar said that about uh, uh, half a billion dollar Indian line of credit for defense. Actually, I am the culprit. I broke this news before Prime Minister's visit to India. I broke this news and believe me, uh, you have no idea what I had to go through for this uh, news. And the number of telephones I received from uh, the military who were paid by my tax. So they gave me a, a pretty hard time. So I want to, as a journalist, I want a change to this situation. And we have a, we are now under a feeling that you cannot report anything about military. You, you cannot say anything about military. As General Munruzzaman has rightly pointed out, that there has to be transparency in military spending, spending because at the end of the day, it is our money. And last, I will sum up, uh, some of, I have some friends who are in military. I mean, I don't know, uh, maybe this, is, this problem is with me. They are not very nice towards civilians. So I, I love to hope that my friends are bad, bad people. Uh, others are good with uh, civilians. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anav, where, where are you? Yes, you have the floor. Please introduce yourself. Hello, uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Anav Said Khan, uh, coordinator of Students Against uh, Discrimination, the movement, and a student of Dhaka University. So I have a uh, question that, uh, how can we regain our fair share over water from our neighbor and how can we protect our people from border killings and uh, regain our uh, air space and uh, uh, naval uh, securities from uh, the neighbors? Because the previous fascist government uh, signed some uh, contracts about uh, this type of, uh, what to say, betraying with their people. So how can we regain and how can we secure our sovereignty? Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Rust, please be very brief. Yes, I am a journalist too, editor of Bangladesh Defense Journal. And what uh, my brother Humayun Bhai has said, the problem with the military, I was also in army once and the present chief is my course mate. Well, well that's, uh, that's a different thing. But I may ask uh, some question to General Hafiz as he is the special assistant to the chief advisor. Sir, this, uh, all, every of us, they are calling, uh, terming the previous government as the fascist regime. Is there any history in the world that a fascist regime or fascist ideology was ever allowed to come back or resurgent? After Second World War, the Nazis were not allowed. After Rwanda, they were not allowed. In Serbia, Bosnia Herzegovina, they were not allowed. And now, about Ayana Ghor and uh, the perpetrators, you know that Brigadier Azmi, Arman, Michael Chakma, they were uh, found alive. They were put in Ayana Ghor. Are you going to take any actions? Are you going to apprehend those criminals? You have not done it yet. Already more than nearly one month is going to end. Only uh, two uh, officers were uh, apprehended, but the main perpetrators were not. Second, Ex-Chief Justice, Mr. Sina, he specifically gave interview in Daily Star and in one uh, American television uh, channel, my Bengali television channel, and he said that one DGDGFI mishandled him and ruthlessly threw him out from Bangladesh. Have you taken, uh, are you going to take any action against that DG? As per my information, he left Bangladesh on 18th August. No action was taken. Third, DGFI and NSI, now they are under tremendous pressure because hundreds of civilian uh, staffs were uh, recruited during the previous government 
politically, from political point of view and from three districts. Now, the present uh, DGs and other officers, they're facing tremendous problems. How to uh, tackle this problem? And uh, can you please take help from the friendly countries like USA, Britain, France, Australia, uh, some, or some other countries like that to uh, refurbish these organizations quickly? Because to my knowledge, only um, and I, they are working very shabbily only, and I, they can put hardly 20% of their capacities now. And that is a big problem, as you were telling. And we don't want ever to see an investigative report like all the prime minister's men, which was aired in Al Jazeera. I, as an ex-military ex officer, I never want that a chief of staff of Bangladesh army ever portrayed like that. That should be ensured. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll first go to Dr. Lalifer. Um, thank you. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, thank you, Shafkat, for pointing out uh, that uh, IR departments, uh, not particularly my department, but IR departments have turned into gender uh, studies department. Um, if that is the case, I'll be extremely proud because gender is an extremely important ingredient in understanding security. The very, uh, we have all, uh, those who have read about Cynthia and Loeb bananas speeches and basis, it argues that how gender has, uh, gender analysis has remained absent in the study of security. So thank you for bringing that out. Uh, and uh, another point is that uh, when we are talking about security, um, a new security agenda, we are not talking about uh, what is security, and this question Shapkat pointed out, uh, and then we are not also talking about who the state is for. So that should be the primary idea, that should be the primary question. From where uh, we will proceed to the next stage, that whose security are we talking about? Uh, are we talking about state security? Are we talking about uh, uh, personal security? So it's not only about traditional security and non-traditional security, but security has many other layers which are often uh, overlapping. This is another question that should be brought into the discussion. Um, and uh, not only that, um, another area would be that, um, that I've been uh, writing for quite some time that um, and uh, pointed out by a number of presenters here that we need uh, not only defense white paper but we need to talk about what are our immediate na national security threat what are our mid-term security threat and what are our long-term security threat and an assessment of uh, our country's uh, immediate dangers at the regional level and at the global level what are the changes at the global level happening remember in 2020 um, uh, China's president Xi Jinping um, uh, pointed out, I think it was at the end of 2019 or early 2020, that uh, there might be a black swan event because in Chinese, uh, Chinese analysis, uh, international threat in that way, and uh, that year we saw um, you know, COVID breaking out. So we do not have any places, any ways to study about this, to have this kind of assessment, and um, something happens and we are caught surprise, um, into a surprise, and we say we are observing the situation. We keep observing the situation, and by that time, it is out of our hand. Um, and not only that, I'd also just um, end by saying that um, whenever we study in the International Relations Department, our students, and I'm very happy to see uh, many of the BUP, IR um, uh, students are here. This is what uh, IR departments are doing, actually. We are producing the next generation of um, analy uh, you know, analytical minds. And um, also that whenever we apply for uh, our uh, masters or PhDs from IR department, they, they are telling us you are applying from Bangladesh, you should uh, look into your property reduction, your development agenda, environment agenda. Why do you want to study security? So that is where, you know, the first uh, predicament any student of IR, and I have my two colleagues here present who would be able to corroborate. So uh, uh, it's not the department that is in charge of talking about uh, security or deciding uh, the discourse. Um, and uh, many of our uh, students in uh, BCS uh, examinations, they don't get to go to MOFA because because it's decided in a different manner. So there are a lot of predicaments on a particular department uh, that should be kept in mind. Um, we can have a larger discussion about this later. I know we are running out of time. Thank, Thank you. you. Pratay, microphone. Thank you, I'm uh, Saki Pratay. I'm one of the coordinators of People's Liberation Platform. We are the civil society organization that has been coordinating this liberation war along with the Students Against Discrimination. So um, 
There are questions about the reform and what should be the uh, benchmarks about the reforms that will be done by this interim government. So the question is very simple, as uh, the Honorable Lord Advisor has mentioned, that reform should be made in such a way that in no way, not even in 20 years, 50 years, any fascist regime can rise up in Bangladesh ever again, never again. So I would like to read out a short statement uh, from on behalf of the citizens of Bangladesh. Anyone sidestepping the core argument regarding bringing about a true reform by labeling it as authoritarian while endorsing a society ruled by the mafia, where the unqualified rise to power by exploiting the vulnerable and the illiterate is revealing the true nature. There are they are resisting the call to reintegrate into a just and modern society because they refuse to let go of the past where their children thrived on wealth amassed through crimes against humanity. The rise of these corrupt souls, nurtured within a system that rewards deceit and exploitation, is the direct consequence of decades of systematic brainwashing. They have been groomed to accept the status quo, a world where power is inherited, not earned where loyalty to a corrupt regime trumps, triumphs, uh, trumps integrity and human decency. These are the products of a society where justice is a commodity brought and sold by those who hold the reign of power and where the very concept of human rights is treated as a disdain. It is precisely because of this moral decay that the time has come to permanently ban such well-documented terrorist fascist organizations. And I'm not just talking about the very recent regime, but I'm talking about anyone who's openly fascist, anyone who wants to impose their will on all the people. So uh, this existence, their existence is a blight on the fabric of our nation and a festering wound that cannot heal while they're allowed to operate. These groups are not merely a political not merely political entities, they are the antithesis of democracy. These enem they are enemies of freedom and the violators of universal human rights. Their ideology is rooted in oppression and their methods are stepped, steeped in violence and fear. Banning openly fascist organizations is not just a legal necessity, it is a moral imperative. We must also eradicate any non-democratic values that run counter to the principles of universal human rights. This means dismantling the structure that enables corruption and injustice and replacing them with systems that promote transparency, accountability, and respect for all individuals. Only by doing so, we can ensure that the future generations inherit a society where power is derived from the will of the people, not from the barrel of a gun or the coffers of the corrupt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you ready? I'll, I'll turn to Mr. Abdullah. Mr. Abdullah was one of the main coordinators of the recent movement. So you can, all, his face is pretty well recognized now. So he will ask the question in Bangla. We shall translate for the rest of you. Okay. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, and Amadir Bangladesh, A. Jobbisher Obutane. যারা ছাত্র জনতা যারা নিহত হয়েছে সবার রুয়ের আত্মার মাগফিরাত কামনা করি এবং যারা আহত চিকিৎসাধীন অবস্থায় আছে সবার জন্য আমরা দোয়া করব আমি আসলে স্পেসিফিকলি কয়েকটা প্রবলেম নিয়ে কথা বলতে চাই আমাদের অভ্যন্তরীণ সমস্যা আশা করি অভ্যন্তরীণভাবেই আমরা সমাধান করতে সক্ষম হব তবে আমাদের কিছু সমস্যা আছে যেটা হচ্ছে আমাদের বাংলাদেশের মানে আমাদের পার্শ্ববর্তী দেশ বলি আর হচ্ছে ইন্টারন্যাশনাল অর্গানাইজেশন বলি ওনাদের সহযোগিতা প্রয়োজন সেক্ষেত্রে ফার্স্ট অফ অল হচ্ছে আমাদের রোহিঙ্গা সমস্যা রোহিঙ্গা সমস্যাটা দীর্ঘদিন যাবৎ মানে বাংলাদেশের মধ্যে জিয়ে রেখে মানে টিকিয়ে রেখেছে তো এইটার পারমানেন্ট সলিউশন দরকার এটার জন্য কি কি করা প্রয়োজন আমাদের বাংলাদেশের সিনিয়র সিটিজেনরা আছে ডিফেন্সের যারা আছে বা আপনারা এ ব্যাপারে স্থায়ী একটা উদ্যোগ নেবেন এবং ইন্টারন্যাশনালি যেন এইটাকে পারমানেন্টলি একদম সলিউশন হয় আর সেকেন্ড বলবো হচ্ছে বর্ডার কিলিং নিয়ে আমাদের প্রায় দু সাল থেকে 
বর্ডার কিলিং এর পরিমাণ অত্যন্ত বাড়ে এবং দুই হাজার চব্বিশ পর্যন্ত এখনো পর্যন্ত লাস্ট মানে আমাদের যে পাঁচই আগস্ট আমরা সরকার পুনর্গঠন করা হয় মানে তত্ত্বাবধায়ক সরকার পুনর্গঠন করার পরেও বর্ডারে কিলিং হয় এটা অত্যন্ত ভয়াবহ এবং এই গত দুই হাজার নয় সাল থেকে আজকে পর্যন্ত অ্যারাউন্ড সাড়ে বারোশোর উপর নির্বিচারে বাঙালি মানুষদেরকে হত্যা করা হয়েছে এইটার সুস্থ তদন্ত করে সুস্থ বিচার দাবি করতেছি এবং এখন থেকে যেন বর্ডারে নির্বিচারে গুলি না গুলি করে যেন মানুষদেরকে হত্যা না করা হয় যদি কোনো অপরাধ থাকে সেটার বিচার হবে কিন্তু বর্ডারে সরাসরি গুলি করে যেন হত্যা না করা এর জন্য আপনারা স্থায়ী পদক্ষেপ নেবেন তৃতীয় নম্বরে বলবো হচ্ছে আমাদের জলবায়ু পরিবর্তনের যেই একটা সমস্যা সামনে বাংলাদেশের মানুষদের বা বাংলাদেশের যে আমাদের সাতচল্লিশ হাজার বর্গমাইল এই বর্গমাইলের উপরে বড় ধরনের একটা বিপর্যয় আসতেছে আসন্ন এই বিপর্যয়ে আমার আমরা কি করতে পারি আমাদের জন্য আমাদের এই জলবায়ুর সমস্যার জন্য কিন্তু দায়ী পৃথিবীর অনেক উন্নত দেশগুলো তো ওনাদের আমাদের পাশে কিভাবে দাঁড়াবে আর আমরা এই সময়টাতে এই যে যেমন লাইক আমাদের কিছুদিন আগে দেখবেন যে হঠাৎ করে হঠাৎ করে আমাদের বাংলাদেশের ভিতরে যে বন্যা আসতেছে বন্যা হবে হ্যাঁ এরকম একটা বড় ঝুঁকিপূর্ণ একটা অবস্থায় যে আমরা পড়ব এটার কোনো অ্যালার্মিং সিস্টেম ছিল না কেউ আমাদেরকে সতর্ক করে নাই পার্শ্ববর্তী দেশ তার দেশে যে পানি এত পরিমাণ মানে বাড়তেছে বৃষ্টি হচ্ছে তাদের পক্ষ থেকে আমাদেরকে কোনো ধরনের পূর্ব সতর্কতা না করেই আমাদের যে এই যে আপনাদের কি বলে আমাদের যে সুইচ গেটগুলো মানে হচ্ছে বিভিন্নভাবে তারা তো বাংলাদেশের চুয়ান্নটা নদীর উপরে অবৈধভাবে বাদ দিয়ে বিভিন্নভাবে নদীর স্বাভাবিক প্রবাহ নষ্ট করে অবৈধভাবে বাদ দিছে এবং এই বাদগুলো বিভিন্ন ব্লকেটগুলো তারা আবার খুলে দিছে কোনো অ্যালার্মিং ছাড়া যার কারণে বাংলাদেশের অনেক অনেক মানুষ পশু পাখি থেকে শুরু করে আমাদের শস্য প্রত্যেকটা বাড়িতেই কিছু শস্য রিজার্ভ ছিল আমাদের আমরা হয়তো বা মাস দুয়েকের মধ্যে একটা দুর্ভিক্ষের দিকে আগাচ্ছি তো এই সময়গুলোতে আমরা কিভাবে সারভাইভ করব এবং ইন্টারন্যাশনালি যারা ওয়ার্ল্ড ওয়াইড আমাদের পাশে আসে সব সময় আমরা আন্তর্জাতিকভাবে যে সকল দেশগুলোকে ইউএসএ থেকে শুরু করে চায়না থেকে শুরু করে ওয়ার্ল্ড ওয়াইড প্রত্যেকটা দেশে আমরা এই সময়ে যা হয়ে গেছে হয়ে গেছে আমরা এটার সোলিউশন চাই এবং এটাকে এই অবস্থা থেকে আমরা কিভাবে রিকভার করব এবং পরবর্তীতে যেন এই রকম কোনো ঝুঁকিপূর্ণ অবস্থা আর আমাদের এই বাংলাদেশে যেন না হয় এবং পৃথিবীর অন্য কোনো দেশেও যেন এইরকম না হয় আর আরেকটা জিনিস হচ্ছে আমাদের বাংলাদেশের আমাদের অনেক ঋণ বাংলাদেশের যে ঋণ আমাদের প্রত্যেকটা মাথা মাথা পিছু আমাদের ঋণের পরিমাণ অ্যারাউন্ড ওয়ান লাখেরও বেশি আমি এক্সাক্ট ফিগারটা আমার খেয়াল আসতেছে না তো এই যে ঋণ একটা বাংলাদেশে প্রত্যেকটা মানুষ ভূমিষ্ঠ মানে একটা শিশু ভূমিষ্ঠ হওয়ার উপরেই পরে তার উপরে যে ঋণটা বর্তমানভাবে আসতেছে এবং এই ঋণের জন্য দায় কিন্তু ছিল হচ্ছে প্রিভিয়াস যেই গভর্নমেন্ট মানে যারা যে পলিটিক্যাল পার্টি যারা থ্রি ট্রাম আমাদেরকে অবৈধভাবে একেবারেই অবৈধভাবে শাসন করছে তাদেরকে এই লাইবিলিটি নিতে হবে আমরা লাইবিলিটি নিতে পারবো না আমাদের যেন লাইবিলিটি এই নেক্সট প্রজন্ম এই প্রজন্ম আমরা যেন এই লাইবিলিটিটা না নেই তার জন্য কি কিভাবে স্টেপ নেওয়া প্রয়োজন আমরা স্টুডেন্ট আমরা সেই ব্যাপারে এক্সপ্লেন করতে পারবো না প্লিজ আপনারা এই ব্যাপারে একটু স্টেপ নিন যেন আমাদের আজকের পরে থেকে বা এই এই স্বাধীন হওয়ার পর থেকে পুনর স্বাধীন হওয়ার পর থেকে যেন আমাদের নতুন কোনো শিশু আমাদের যে ছাত্রছাত্রীরা আমরা সারভাইভ করতেছি আমাদের ওপর যেন এই ঋণের বোঝাটা না থাকে থ্যাংক ইউ থ্যাংক ইউ Shavkat, please. Very uh, inspiring words by our uh, student coordinator of the Students Against Discrimination Movement, Mr. Abdullah. He first opened by paying tribute to all the martyrs. He has identified several issues which uh, he thinks the interim government should look at or we should all look at as the policy community. First, he talked about the Rohingya crisis and how we need to work with the international community to find a resolution to the Rohingya crisis and how we have been dealing with the burden of the Rohingya crisis for seven years. General Shahid has already talked about that. He also raised an issue which is uh, a question of all Bangladeshis, the whole issue of border killing. 
and he gave some statistics that since the previous government the, uh, under the Sheikh Hasina's regime took over in uh, 2009, 1,250 people have been killed. Where is the accountability for that border killing? I want to just add one more thing to what Mr. Abdullah said, that the border killing issue was never properly raised, but this interim government, the Honorable Foreign Advisor, in his first meeting, he has raised the border killing issue. Mr. Abdullah also talked about the debilitating impacts of climate change. I have also alluded to that in my remarks. And he talked about how climate change is going to become one of the biggest challenges facing Bangladesh. And he urges all of us that we must find ways to work with our friends and partners in the international community to counter this challenge. He dwelt at length about the effects of the latest flood, how our country was never given proper warning by the upper riparian country, and the floods, the challenges it has created, the uh, crops it has destroyed, and potentially we could have a food security situation. He has alerted us to that. Thank you for doing that. And he has also talked about uh, the enormous amount of debt the Sheikh Hasina regime has left us. $156 billion, ladies and gentlemen, is Bangladesh's current debt. Who is liable for this debt? He asks, and I echo his question. Is it us who should be liable for this debt? Or is it the Sheikh Hasina regime who should be liable for this predatory economic policy and the debt trap that Bangladesh has entered? I think that is a very pertinent question. So once again, on behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank you for your kind participation and for highlighting. We salute you and all members of the Students Against Discrimination and all our youth and students who have brought us this monsoon revolution. Thank you. Uh, our last question for this afternoon is by General Nuruddin Khan. General Nuruddin Khan is our former Chief of Army Staff and the senior most living Chief of Army Staff. Uh, uh, thank you, the Chair, for giving me the time. <coughs> Honorable Chair, Honorable Defense Advisor, General Hafiz, ladies and gentlemen, and the journalists present, and Excellencies, assalamu alaikum. Time is very short. I'll just quickly go through all of the points to save the time. Uh, we have two neighbors. One is India. Big Brother, and that is Barma. The chair has discussed it in elaborate form. I would just like to draw your kind attention that with the Rakhine coming in, Rakhine army growing up, we have no problem with the eastern side. Because it is in their own interest, the Rakhine army and the Rakhines should be friendly with us, so we are happy about that issue. Next is the Big Brother India. They have done for the last 16 years whatever damage they could to the Bangladesh community. You all know it. That's why the revolution came in. Uh, they have their weakness too. They have their weak point too. We may be a small country, but a big nation of 18 crore people. It's a big asset for us. And they have got their seven sisters, which is their weakest spot. And they have got Arunachal Pradesh, which is the target of China. And they're very concerned about that. So with these weaknesses, India bothers us too much. We also know how to react to it in it. And they will be uh, very, very, very careful about doing that. We have our own weapon. And this is a big weapon, I can assure you this. A corridor issue, thank God the regime has gone. It will be detrimental and suicidal for us. Now I'll request the Honorable Defense Advisor and the government to make sure that no corridor passes through our club to your land. It will be terrible for us. National Security Council, when I was the Army Chief, I tried my best to start it. I worked out details, worked out papers for that, presented to the government, but I could not convince the government to 
agreed to by Professor of National Security Council. It is there in many countries in the world. And without that, you cannot contain the DGFI and other agencies who have done so much damage to the country. And along with, I would like to mention, the DGFI comes directly under the government, there is a prime minister. I would suggest here that if it could be possible, honorable defense advisor, the DGFI should be brought under the chief of army staff. He should not function independently under the prime minister. Intelligence agencies, they have become monsters. We all talked about it. There's high time that they should be brought under control and taken care. Government should be servants of the people and the masters. With these lessons learned, I'm sure the present government and the future governments will understand that. Defense strategy and defense policy, a very important subject. We have experts in our army and our forces who can work out these strategies and the policies who should be honored by the government when it's submitted to the government later. Uh, I sincerely pray for the salvation of the martyrs who gave their life. They have saved us from the crisis. And pray for quick recovery of the injured volunteers who sustained injuries and in the hospital. And those who are alive after this incident, I pray for their future bright life and happiness. May Allah bless us all. May the country prosper. May the country grow and develop. And we can see it in the future to be a very developed and peaceful country. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, our Honorable Minister. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We shall now turn back to our panelists. But for the interest of time, each of you can have maximum two minutes to respond. So you can choose what you want to respond. We'll start with you, Shahid. Two minutes. Um, I'd just like to um, respond to the uh, Abdullah's one that uh, I'm sure uh, border killing is going to stop. You know, the five, uh, so far, last 15 years, we had been timid. We are not responding the way you are supposed to respond. But before, uh, let's say, uh, up to 2007, how many? Uh, uh, our citizens were killed in the border, very few. But after 2008, actually it was flat because we didn't, we, we didn't react or rather we could not allow to be react. That's the one of the major thing. I'm sure this is going to reduce. Thank you very General, much. Sir. General, give me one minute. Okay. I want to make a one minute comment. Okay. Please be very quick. Uh, it's, it's sorry, it's uh, sorry uh, you know, I'm, I have forced myself because there is a pertinent, uh, you know, question that came up about the border killing. My name is Major Retired Ashraf Othola. I'm a freedom fighter. And within the months of uh, our liberation, I lost my leg defending the independence of the nation. So I have a perception of a freedom fighter, a former army officer, and a diplomat who had served in the diplomacy of government Bangladesh for nearly 35 years. So I bring perspectives from three. So I'm not going to that. So what I was telling, uh, I just heard about the border killing. Since my retirement in 2010, I have been very close to the, all the Indian high commissioners, uh, you know, diplomatic kind of relationship. And my perception is that all of them, all of them, without exception, were very, very myopic. They had a preconceived notion, and they looked at Bangladesh from their uh, inner narrative, not from within what Bangladesh is. A, Bang a diplomat's job, I am a diplomat, our job is to know a country from inside out, not from outside in, what the, you know, uh, the tourists do. But coming to the, back to the point, I asked one of the Indian High Commissioners, I don't want to mention his name, I said, look, we mentioned that we have a golden relationship and husband-wife uh, relationship. So why have you turned our border 
into the most dangerous border in the world. And why, you know, I know there are a lot of things going on between India and Bangladesh, but why you are killing our nations on any flimsy, you know, you know ground, uh, flimsy ground, uh, uh, unnecessarily you are killing them. And this is a visual impact that impacts the people of the country. That's the how in engenders the hatred, but indifference, but or, or, or the kind of sentiment in this country. And you know what that High Commissioner told me? Knowing that I was a diplomat, I was a very senior diplomat, he told me, Ashraf, there are many educated people who look at the big, bigger canvas. So see the rudeness. He told me, literally interpreted that I am uneducated. So that was the kind of perception that he, all of them, except without any exception. So thank you very much. Thank you. Shavkat. Thank you. A um, lot of important points have been made. I don't want to dwell on it. I would like to thank the Honorable Advisor for kindly attending this program. And I'm really flattered that he has watched my interview. And your point is very well taken, sir. But in other interviews, I have raised that issue. Uh, Professor Lailufer is not here. Uh, she and I have a slightly different perception on what IR departments should and should not do. I'm also a student of international relations and security studies, so I know what I'm talking about. Gender studies is important in its own right. I have no disrespect for any discipline of academics, but she knows very well that uh, not only her department, but most of the international relations departments in the country, what they were doing for the last 16 years. But anyway, we can talk about that offline. That's not our agenda. I just want to underscore a point that Abdullah and others have made. Bangladesh must regain its dignity. If there was one thing that was taken away from the people of Bangladesh, it was their dignity. We were living in a republic of fear, not a people's republic of Bangladesh. And that is something that we have to reclaim. And unless we have our dignity within our own country, we will not be able to stand tall and talk to international actors. Respected Lieutenant General Nuruddin Khan has raised a very important point, that we may be a small nation geographically, yes we are, and we are also dwarfed by a large country, so we are actually bigger than many countries, but we look small because in comparison we may have an asymmetry. But we have 180 million people, and that is our biggest asset. And in order to secure this country, we must harness the power of this population. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. About the, about the BDR killing, uh, let me give you a personal uh, example. I, have, I had uh, three different TV uh, uh, interviews with BSF uh, chiefs, Indian BSF chiefs, in Tara TV in Calcutta. And my impression, I'm talking about 2007, 2008. And my impression from him was that the, the BSF was shit scared of the BDR. They were very, very scared of the BDR because the order was for every one bullet, one bullet must be fired back. Not three, but one. And don't get shot at the back. That was the year. And uh, they were really, really very good. And I think 25th February, perhaps, is 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 consequent uh, a result of that. Uh, you know, their, their feeling about the BDR. Remember, India pursues its foreign policy to serve its national interest. It will not pursue its foreign policy to serve Bangladesh's national interest. My question is, have we pursued a foreign policy to serve our national interest? I got the impression last 16 years that our foreign policy was pursued to serve Indian national interest. I'm being very bland, undiplomatic, but I'm a soldier and I make no apologies for it. What sort of foreign policy we pursue when you say that, yes, before going to China, we have discussed with India that we are going to China. Is that sovereignty? Is yes, sovereignty? We were, we were slightly better, slightly better perhaps, because we had the, the patina of independent sovereignty, but slightly better than, 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 than uh, well, we were a Korodrad, we were a Vasali state. And, and, and I make no apologies for saying it. We had lost our dignity. Let us stand up on our feet. We are a nation of 17 people 
We are, we are, we are, we are a big country, not a, not a small country, but a big nation. And we can stand on our feet. We have strategic assets that we can use to pry from them Tisa waters. We have given away the land roofs, we have given away the ports, we have given all the facilities. Take them back. Tisa water will flow automatically. Why have we given them? We opened our arms, but we have not got anything in return. We got back full of promises. What sort of foreign policy is it? Just for the sake of perpetuating your political power, you see the country's interest without any tangible return. This is not the country that we, the three million people, three million martyrs lost their lives. This, con this land is hallowed by their blood. And now it has been hallowed by the blood of the students. Yes. Gen uh, 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 Generation Z. They must take over the reins of this country, not left to the ossified politicians. We have lost all credibility as politicians. We want new, new blood, we want new breed in politics. Not people whose only concern is to make money, whose concern is the interest of the people, his, na his neighbor, whose concern is to keep money in the country, not to make houses in Canada or in, or in, or in Switzerland. And that can only be done if you have a completely new crop. Weed these deadwoods out of politics. Prune this country of this sort of politicians. And, uh, and, and I would request your, your, your generation to come up and take up the reins. We are talking about binary terms in politics. Two, two political parties. Why can't there be a third and the fourth and fifth one? Alternatives. Because we have seen every single party that has come to power have, out, have outdone the previous one in, 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 in all sorts of bad deeds. We, we, blame, we blame the military regimes for killing of democracy, but who killed democracy? It was killed, killed on 75, uh, 97, 22nd January, not by, 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 by in, 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 on 15th August 75. So therefore, let us take a stock of the things. Let us, let us assess the things that we have to do. And let us hand over. It's time to pass on the baton. That is my last word. Thank you. Thank you very much. I shall not try to summarize, because we are quite late on the day. Uh, I would only like to say that this is new Bangladesh. We have an opportunity to reshape our future again an opportunity that was taken from the people of Bangladesh. We have regained what we lost. It is now for us to charter a new course, a new Bangladesh, where people's aspirations are met, people's aspiration for a free Bangladesh, a democratic Bangladesh is once again regained. People have reclaimed their liberty, people have reclaimed their freedom, and that is what the armed forces are here to keep. I wish you all all the very best. I thank you all for coming, especially our young guests who are here with us for the first time. I hope you come again to our round tables. Next month, we'll have another interesting set of discussions. We shall let you know in advance. So please join me in thanking our young students and the panelists. And now please join us for a cup of coffee outside. Thank you. Thank you.